Welcome to Motivated to Lead Podcast, helping you become a better leader. I'm your host, Mark Klingsein. Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining us for our podcast this week. Uh, my name is Mark Klingsheim with SEMA Partners. Each week, we interview leaders and they share lessons learned from their careers. Our goal is to help you become a better leader. This week, we're happy to have joining us Kirk Williams. Kirk is the Chief Human Resources Officer at Donnelly Financial Solutions. He is also the Communications Officer. He's worked as a, a CHRO uh, for the last number of years and has worked for large companies uh, across industry. And uh, he has some great thoughts he's going to share from his career and uh, lessons learned. Looking forward to today's conversation with Kirk. And it's great to, to have Kirk joining us for our conversation. And uh, I guess, first off, Kirk, could you give us just a, a little bit of your career story, a little bit of your, your background? Sure. Uh, so I grew up in Phoenix. And uh, since I was a little boy, I always wanted to be an airline pilot. I always loved commercial airplanes and traveling and going to the airport. And that was my, uh, you know, my career path until I realized how expensive it was to become an airline pilot. And so I kind of changed courses. I started working at Walmart in high school, and then I continued working full-time in college. And it was in the summer of uh, my junior year, I was an intern in Bentonville, uh, a long series of events, light bulbs went off. I ended up going to law school, ended up specializing in labor and employment law with the intention of after law school going to work at Walmart and fi fighting labor unions. And that's exactly what I did. So I graduated law school, took the bar exam, moved to Arkansas, worked for Walmart again for about six years, um, started in labor relations and then took on broader HR responsibilities. And so uh, when I first got out of school, I never would have really imagined what a CHRO was and what that job entitled. I had no aspirations to that. I just was thinking about you know, what was next after law school and, and paying off my student loans, quite frankly. Uh, and then um, you know, my career has just kind of taken a path in terms of taking on additional responsibilities. I've, this is my third uh, CHRO role in my career. Uh, so it's very exciting to now have the full depth and breadth uh, of an HR role. But that's, uh, that's a little bit of a nutshell of, of where I am uh, today. Well, I'd love to ask this question, ask it of most uh, every guest, if you were able to turn back time and knowing what, what you know now, uh, talk to a 22-year-old uh, Kirk, what, what advice would you give? It's such a great question. And I was asked that in an interview a few years ago, uh, and I've adopted it as an interview question. So anyone who ever is going to be interviewed by me, just <laughs> be prepared. I do, ask, I do ask the question. Um, for me, uh, I think the most important thing is nothing is more important than living an authentic life. And that means something different for everyone. In my case, it was very personal. Um, but being authentic and being who you are and showing up who you are every day is much more important than your title, how much money you make, where you live, what company you work for, et cetera. And uh, it took me a few years, it took me about uh, 10 years to really figure that out. And once I did figure it out, my life changed, my career changed, and it was very impactful. Um, that said, you know, easier said than done. And that means something different for everyone. But that's how I, I think it would be for me is nothing is more important than living an authentic life. Great. So kind of on the flip side of it, any advice that you received that you should have ignored early on in your career? You know, that's an interesting question. Uh, you know, we all go to seminars and conferences and hear, you know, speakers like myself in this case tell, you know, all of these words of wisdom. I don't think I ever heard bad advice. What I think uh, was important or is important is to kind of think about it in terms of your own personal context. So a good example is people say, well, you should have work-life balance. Oh, okay, easy to say. That means something very different to every person, right? And so I would, I would say the advice that I've gotten over the course of my career has been interesting, some more relevant at the time than others, but you have to listen to it or think about it through the lens of your own personal situation and, and where you find yourself. So instead of saying you should have work-life balance, I would say work-life balance is important, but it's also in the eye of the beholder. I'm single. I don't have kids. That's going to be a different work-life balance than somebody who has a family that they're taking care of, right? 
Um, we all do it in a different way. So doing it is important, but you don't have to do it like someone else does it. And I think that that's a harder lesson to learn too, right? Because as a younger person growing up in your profession, you see these people who have been successful and you want to emulate those types of behaviors and the advice that they give. Um, but it's really more personal. And that's the secret, I think, to, to really making it more impactful in your life. As you go through the process and one of your your big responsibilities is is making sure that that you're hiring the right people and putting the right uh, executives in place and other leaders within the organization. Uh, looking back, what what advice would you give someone that's hiring their first leadership team? Uh, what are some some thoughts you have around that? It, it's going to sound cliche, but um, people who are different than you can make you better. And so I think it's easy to want to find people who are look like you have your same kind of pedigree in my case i have a big personality so it's easy to you know uh, to be attracted to people who are bigger personalities but what i've found over time is that uh, the people who are different from me who have a different experience or a different personality help make me better uh, and help make the team better um, but in, importantly in that i think it's really important to trust your gut instinct Right. I think each of us has uh, generally we don't get to the positions where we are, even as your first manager, without having demonstrated good instincts and good decision making. So I think it's really important to trust your gut, trust your instinct on um, people. There have been instances in my career where I haven't done that. And, you know, I look back and think, gosh, if I would have just trusted what I initially thought, things would have been um, very different. But I also think you're going to make mistakes, right? You're going to think someone's the best person ever and they're going to disappoint you. And you're also going to find people who you're on the fence about may really shine and really um, perform in a way that was unexpected. So, you know, I, I think it's it's a mixture of trust your instinct, look for people who are different than you. Um, and uh, I think that that's helped me along the way. So how, how have you seen the, uh, the role of CHRO uh, change over, over time? You've, you've been in that, that role. Uh, how has it morphed? And, and uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think today more than ever, uh, especially in the pandemic, <clears throat> our, our role is also about empathy and leader, you know, thinking about the impacts, real world impacts have on employees. Right. It's not so much about production levels or, you know, checklists or or certain performance metrics. It's also about how people are doing personally. And I think the pandemic is changing the workforce in ways that we still don't know what those will ultimately look like. Uh, my company went uh, from a, in the office five days a week to virtual over a weekend, like many other companies did. Uh, and we found that it became a strategic advantage for us. And we're in a fully flex model. That may not work for every company. It's working for ours, at least for the time being. Um, but I do think the things around um, personal relationships, collaboration, those, those things that you just can't um, learn through an email or learn through video are really going to be critical. So I think for my, for my role and for people in my role, it's really important to think about the longer term impacts and how do you build um, camaraderie, connection? How do people really understand the culture and kind of, you know, if you're in the office, you see how people walk and what they wear into meetings and how they behave and, you know, the kind of water cooler chat that you just don't get sitting in your living room. So I think that's a that's a big um, change. I also think, you know, I, I've never been a fan of the notion of, you know, we have to have our seat at the table. I've, I've been fortunate, I guess, um, in the roles that I have, especially in the role I have today, where I'm a trusted business advisor and my CEO expects me to have a point of view on helping him run the business that's beyond HR, right? So I think it's really important for HR professionals to understand how the business works, how the company makes money, you know, what a balance sheet is, how to, you know, read a PL um, and really think about the le levers um, in how the business can be more successful. And then my job is to take that strategic uh, uh, imperative for the corporation or the initiatives for the corporation and then craft people strategies. Uh, around that. It, if you don't know how that business works, I think you're kind of dead in the water um, in terms of, you know, crafting those uh, people solutions. And my my suspicion is those are the types of people who say, well, HR doesn't have a seat at the table. 
right? You have to know how the business works to, to have that. So I, I think that's how it's changing. Um, and, you know, look, it's uh, uh, somebody once said um, each year is more difficult than the last. And I'm sure that's been said for millennia. And I would say this year is more difficult than last. And I, I'm sure 2022 will be more difficult than uh, 2021. So you have to kind of be adaptable, flexible, roll with the punches um, and, and help the business along the way. So is there anything that you've done as a company just to keep uh, people together, even though they're working virtually, anything that, that you've done that's worked, worked effectively just to keep the team kind of connected, even though they're, they're in separate locations? Yeah, we started early, like I'm sure many companies, you know, virtual happy hours and, you know, virtual lunches and those types of things. Uh, as vaccines were more readily available, we have opened our offices to vaccinated employees um, for collaboration and team events. I'm having my leadership team in actually next Tuesday and Wednesday um, in Chicago. And, you know, we're following all of the safety protocols. So we're requiring those employees who come to the office to be vaccinated. Um, so we're, we're doing everything we can in that regard. So as we can do things like in-person meetings, team collaboration events, lunches, dinners, uh, we're doing those. Um, but I do think it's, it takes a different leadership uh, skill set. Um, we have to be much more intentional in terms of how we lead people and that how we talk to them in our one-on-ones um, to the extent we can meet them for lunch or dinner or you know outside of of the workplace um, to keep that personal connection i do think that that's uh, critically important uh, you know every company is going to have their own formula right um, some companies are pushing everyone in the office and if that works for them um, i can't criticize that some will never go back to the office i think you know over time We'll see how the dust settles on on all of this. So you've had a seat at the table. You work, uh, have meetings in the boardroom that you're part of the strategic team as far as uh, that. But right. any advice you'd give uh, to somebody that's a new leader that maybe doesn't have the experience of working with a board? Anything that you've learned? Yeah, I think two things come to mind. Um, number one, um, the, the board's job is not to run the company. And so the board members are not going to have the level of expertise or in-depth um, understanding of how the business runs as the management team does. And so I think it's always uh, uh, hard for people who don't ever have that exposure, right? They want to bring the board members along the way in terms of giving them every detail and, and having them understand every nuance of the business. And that's really not their job, right? Their job is to fly the plane at 50,000 feet, think about things from a shareholder perspective. So I think that's that's one part. Um, I think the other part is, you know, directors by and large, at least the ones I've had the privilege of working with, um, want the company to be successful and they're there to help. And, um, you know, that said, we shouldn't always agree on everything. We should have difficult conversations when necessary. We should um, you know, challenge each other and, and have, you know, tough, uh, uh, you know, they should ask tough questions of us as management. Um, but at the end of the day, their interest for shareholders are the same as management interest for shareholders and that we want the company to be better and, and they are here um, to help us. It, it shouldn't be adversarial. It shouldn't be us versus them. It's just another um, set of people helping, you know, the company meet its, its uh, strategic goals. So any books, uh, you've got a team that you lead and uh, uh, any books that you, you recommend to your team or to other leaders that, that you think would be good for people to put on there? Uh, I, I love this question um, because the very first book that came to mind is probably going to shock you how I define why I think it's important. Uh, but Jim Collins' book, From Good to Great, uh, is a really important book. And the reason I think it's important is because I disagree with his premise that everything has to be great all of the time, right? His first chapter is we don't have great schools because we have good schools. We don't have great this because we have good that and good is the enemy of great. What I would write the book would be to say sometimes good enough is good enough. And the key is to understand when you need to be great. And what are those things that you can be great at versus when is a solid C plus acceptable or when is good enough, good enough, right? And, and I think especially newer leaders, they want, you know, especially type A, they're driven, they wanna be successful in everything that they do. They want the A plus on everything. 
And I think the secret is understanding when to flex that muscle, right? Not everything can be A plus, but if you read that book, you're left with, and I think it's a great book and Jim is incredibly smart. Um, you're left with how to make everything greater. That should be the goal. And I'm not certain. I, I think that's uh, necessarily true. I'm sure many people may disagree with that. And, and I welcome that. Um, the other book that I think is really helpful and, and actually I've, I've used with my teams is Radical Candor by Kim Scott. Uh, Kim was an executive at Google and she shares a personal story uh, between her and Sheryl Sandberg, who's now the COO of Facebook. And it just resonated with me so much because I had one of those radical candor conversations with a, a leader um, who I worked for earlier in my career. And it was such an important piece of advice that she gave. And when you read the book, you realize that, um, you know, you have to care personally about people, but that also means you need to challenge directly, doing it respectfully and all of those things. But radical candor really helps make people better um, and it's a, you know, it's a continuum, um, but I, I think it's just very important that, especially as we lead people, it doesn't matter their level or title. I think people have the same intrinsic desires. They want <clears throat> good communication. They want to work for a winning team, but they also want to do a good job. And I think no one wakes up in the morning and says, I want to be average. No one wakes up in the morning and says, I want to do mediocre work. Um, sometimes we have a good day and sometimes we have a bad day, but our job as leaders is to help people be successful. And I think Radical Candor is a great book to help um, leaders navigate that really the more important part is having that personal relationship that allows you then to be more you know, candid with, uh, with people. Um, the third book I've used a lot um, over the years is 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership by John Maxwell. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an interesting book because it, it's 21 laws, so there's 21 chapters. They're very short uh, vignettes um, and, and very quick read. Um, I think the key takeaway is it makes you think about each of the laws specifically, um, but at the end you realize that you can't do all 21 of them well. And I think it's helpful to understand where do you think you are on the 21 in terms of where you're good, where you aren't as good, and how you can uh, be better, um, and which of those laws may be more important for the job that you're in, right? Our jobs change over time, the companies change over time, um, and as leaders, we have leadership muscle that we have to flex in different situations, and I think it's just a good kind of self-awareness uh, uh, book in terms of uh, leadership. Yeah, those are uh, definitely great, uh, great books to put on your list. Any quotes that you uh, kind of refer to on a regular basis? I recently found out my team has a list of Kirkisms, um, <laughs> and those Kirkisms are probably a collection of um, other isms from leaders that I've had the privilege of working for. Um, so that that you'd have to ask them some of their favorites. I think two that come to mind. Uh, number one, easy jobs don't make us better. And so, uh, you know, as I look at my career and think about jobs and think about, you know, opportunities ahead, um, easy jobs don't make us better. Smooth seas don't make good sailors is a different way of, of saying that. And you have to go through the tough times to be able to appreciate the better times, but the tough times are really what makes us better uh, as leaders and give us a different perspective um, in the role that we're in. Um, and, and then another quote that has always been um, top of mind uh, early in my career, uh, a long tenured uh, executive at Walmart said, the cost of perfection is bankruptcy. Hmm. And I think that was very helpful to think, again, going back to the notion of good to great and flexing when good enough is good enough. Um, we can't be perfect. No, there's no perfect business. Uh, and the aspiration to be perfect will drive you to bankruptcy, right? If you don't want any litigation, then close the doors. If you don't if you run a retail store, you don't want any shoplifting or slip and falls then close the door. So, you know, bankruptcy. Um, so again, I think the secret is flexing. When is good enough, good enough? When do you need the A plus versus a solid B um, going forward? So are you uh, an analog person or are you digital as far as in your personal productivity? So um, I've never really been a paper person. Um, I'll take notes and then I've been, I'm very grateful and blessed that I have a very good memory. Um, so I'll take notes when I need, but I don't keep paper. 
Um, I've never kept paper. Uh, I just, I don't like the clutter and I don't find myself going back to it. Um, so I'm, I'm more digital. Uh, I always thought I was technologically advanced until um, I started having people work for me who were younger, uh, much younger, and realized that I'm, even though I don't feel like I'm that old, I, I feel like a technology dinosaur in some ways, right? Um, I just prefer text message. I don't like to be on a Teams chat or Slack or all of those things. And I think there's so many, you know, technologies always hitting us um, from our personal life and work life. Um, that I've tried to kind of protect, like, here's the best way to reach me. Now, that may be inconvenient um, for people who work with me, and I apologize for that, but um, that's that's kind of how I manage. But I, I'm more on the digital side and, you know, try to keep up as much as I can with, with the technology. So have any of the uh, technology productive uh, software or apps, uh, anything that uh, you couldn't, couldn't live without or be tough to live without? Well, I don't know if there's an app specifically. I mean, I couldn't live without my iPhone. Um, I think about, you know, perhaps weirdly, uh, if something were to happen in my house, what three things do I need to grab? It would be my iPhone, my laptop, and my passport. Um, you know, the rest is kind of just sure. stuff and can be replaced. Um, but, you know, we're, we're so reliant on our phones, whether it's for banking or you know, just everything, pictures, and, you know, I have my vaccine picture on my phone. I've, you know, so it's just, I think it's just the overall iPhone. I'm an Apple aficionado, so I'm yeah. sure they're glad to hear that. Okay. <laughs> so outside of work, uh, what do you like to do to, to recharge? Uh, I love traveling. So going back to the love of airplanes, uh, I love to travel. I, um, I'm one of those weirdos that doesn't mind a 15 or 16 hour flight. Uh, because you're going someplace exciting. Uh, I'm a beach person uh, and scuba diving and boats and water. So uh, I know a lot of my friends are very excited that we're going into winter to winter ski. Uh, I'm uh, the opposite. I'll be headed to uh, Mexico over the holidays uh, and enjoying the sun. Um, that I, I enjoy that. I also uh, love, I'm a foodie. So in experiencing new restaurants and different food and different culture is uh, fun. And then um, for those places where there is a soul cycle, I'm a big soul cycle fan. So uh, uh, there's a couple here in the city of Chicago that I like to go to. I just find it's a nice way to have 45 minutes of no distraction. Um, it's good workout, it's good exercise. You get to listen to good music, uh, but you don't have a phone with you. You're not able to be distracted and uh, that helps me kind of reset. Favorite, favorite restaurant in Chicago? Oh, that's a tough one. It depends on the food. Um, what, what are you looking for? Um, There's so many great restaurants here and, and so many good ones that continue to, to pop up. Um, I think Piccolo Sogno is always a favorite for Italian. They have, I think, the best outdoor space in the city, in my view. I, I'm, I know the chef well. Uh, the food's always on point. The service is spectacular. It's not too pricey, um, but I, it's one of my favorites for Italian, but if you want a steak recommendation or anything else, happy to give it to you. <laughs> All right. So what, uh, what parting advice would you give a, uh, a newer upcoming leader? Yeah, I, I, you know, one of the things that um, I, worked for me, and again, people should look at this through their own lens, was I, I tried to be a sponge uh, and tried to be around as many successful accomplished people as I could to just, you know, learn through osmosis uh, in many ways. Um, and I sought out mentors. Uh, I sought out people who, um, you know, for example, when I was the intern at Walmart, I uh, became friends with the head of labor relations who later became the head of HR for Walmart. And she was a mentor for me through law school and, and beyond. And I think that was really important. Mentors are helpful where you can just kind of check in, engage, um, but, you know, hearing different perspectives, hearing these podcasts and hearing different uh, perspectives and points of view uh, and seeing what resonates. Not everything that everyone says is going to resonate. Somebody may listen to this and think, gosh, this guy's a weirdo. I don't believe or agree with anything he says. And other may say, gosh, he's the best thing since sliced bread. Um, and there will be the, the spectrum. Um, but I think it's really important to listen, um, stay up to date on trends, stay up to date on what's going on in the world. Uh, be inquisitive, uh, really ask good questions, um, you know, and uh, I think that that's helpful. 
Well, I sure appreciate your your insights today and appreciate, uh, I'll give a shout out to Donette uh, Beverly, who introduced us and she was a guest on our podcast uh, some time ago. And uh, definitely wish you continued success in your career you. and all that you're doing. Great. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. And uh, Donette is a great leader and uh, high energy. So hopefully I brought some of that energy that she uh, she gives as well. But she's a great leader and we're, we're glad to have her at Donnelly Financial. Yeah. Thanks so much, Kurt. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Motivated to Lead podcast. Please subscribe on iTunes. You can also see a video version of this interview at motivatedtolead.com. This podcast is brought to you by SEMA Partners, helping you find your next great leader.